Okay, well, good morning and welcome. Good to see so many familiar faces back and some new people as well, and hope we get to know each other as, as the weeks and months go along. Now, spirituality. Let's get down to it here, okay? It's a kind of a common buzzword these days, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't remember growing up hearing that word a lot, not even through the 70s and 80s. Did you? People talked about what religion they belonged to, but they didn't talk about spirituality a whole lot. But if you go to bookstores now, there's whole big sections on spirituality. And my, the different kinds of books you find there, right? You might find St. John of the Cross right next to a book on the chakras and working with crystals and whatnot, all the different things that come under this umbrella. So it's one of the signs of the times, I believe, this hunger for spirituality. And why is that, we might ask? It's because human beings are concerned about meaning. What makes one tick? Why get out of bed in the morning? Those are some of the, the concerns of spirituality. What motivates us from within? Sometimes one isn't sure, you know, what it is. It, it can take a while to get in touch with one's own answer to these questions. Life can be very fragmenting. One way that spiritual writers like to talk about things is Thomas Merton, for example, and even C.S. Lewis, that we have something of an outer self that relates to the culture and an inner self where our own feelings and motives and desires and dreams reside. Sometimes the demands of the culture and our outer self are so strong and so intense that we can lose touch with this inner self, this inner part of our being. We can even be afraid to go there, to explore what's there. It's something of a stranger to us. The roles we play, the work requirements, etc. And there's a lot of fragmentation in our culture from technology, I believe. That's rather new. I saw a picture the other day on the New Yorker, the modern family vacation. There's mom and dad and son and daughter standing next to each other on the beach, and they're texting. And hopefully they weren't texting each other. And that fragments us too. So we're dealing with a lot of fragmentation, and people have this hunger for spirituality. Here's another way of talking about spirituality is where is your treasure? And Jesus used that language. Where your treasure is, there is your heart. But you have to be in touch with that. What, what is your heart's desire? And getting in touch with our heart's true and deepest desires is one of the things that spirituality is about. Here's a question. Why spirituality? Why this interest and concern for spirituality? It is because human beings have a spiritual consciousness. And we'll go more into that in a few moments, what we need by that. And there are a lot of ways that people speak of that word consciousness. It's an approach that I like to use to speak of spirituality in terms of cultivating a certain kind of consciousness. For most people, consciousness means to be aware. But there's a broader meaning of consciousness as well, where we can speak of consciousness as any entity's manner of knowing. So in that sense, you can say, that dogs have a kind of consciousness, don't they? They have a certain way of knowing. They have dog consciousness. Um, how about trees? Well, they do, but it's very much simpler than the dogs or chimpanzees or humans, isn't it? It's a kind of a sensitivity to the environment, you know? I see these sunflowers when I'm driving here, and they're all facing toward the east, smiling at the sun, waiting for the sun to come up. You see plants that open their leaves and close their leaves at certain times. They're responding to environmental cues. What about a rock? Does a rock have consciousness? Mary's nodding. Yes, of course. It has rock consciousness, whatever that is. 
I don't know, but uh, we could say, using this definition, if it's an entity's manner of knowing that a rock has a kind of mineral consciousness or chemical consciousness, okay, that's explained in terms of its chemistry. Okay, so a spiritual consciousness is a consciousness that has the ability to know spiritually. And so everybody has a spirituality of some kind because everybody has a human spirit. So the question is not, you know, are you a spiritual person? Well, you can't help it. That's how we were created. We were given spiritual consciousness. The question is, what is your spirituality? What gives your life meaning? What gives your life a sense of importance? And again, sometimes that's difficult to answer. But you might just, we might just pause here. How would you answer that question? For yourself right now what is your spirituality just to jot down some words that say something about what gives your life a sense of meaning or purpose okay let's look then at more about what we mean by spiritual consciousness said a little bit about it, consciousness is an entity's manner of knowing. We say human beings have a spiritual consciousness that's different from, let's say, an animal's kind of a consciousness or a plant or a rocks or something like that. What we mean by spiritual consciousness is that we do have this ability to access this inner dimension of life, this inner self that goes beyond what our senses and instincts present to us something that's happening within us, some kind of a story, some kind of a response that's going on that's not completely determined by the environment, okay? And so some evidence of this consciousness. Ah, do you hear that? The arts express the inner life. They give expression to that inner life. And so are evidence of it complex music of Bach goes way beyond the kinds of sounds we hear animals making as they set boundaries or articulate their mating call. Bach's not doing this, is he? What is he doing? He's giving expression to his joy, his inner life. It can be a pondering about what's out there. Are there other life forms in the universe? How did the universe come to be? Is there a creator behind it all? What might this creator be like? What can we learn about that creator from the creation? You might not think this one is very spiritual, but it is. The work of mathematicians and physicists their reflections on the order of the universe, they go several steps beyond what sensory data presents to our awareness. The human intellect is a powerful spiritual faculty. Cave paintings from 15,000 years ago are expressions of that inner life. More modern art expresses our religious beliefs such as this famous piece by Leonardo da Vinci. And sacred architecture is less about providing shelter for the body than lifting the mind to consider higher things. So evidence for spiritual consciousness is all around us, isn't it? Often it's the extraordinary quality of ordinary human life that calls us to wander and amazement, which are sure signs of spiritual vitality. How could a human being, in all its complexity, develop from one single cell? What is the intelligence that guides this developmental process? Such wanderings and ponderings give evidence of the human spirit. So you see, it's not that abstract and complicated or scary. Human beings are naturally spiritual, 
and we give expression to that all the time, don't we? So let's talk about this a little more, maybe getting a little philosophical, but not, not too heavy. However, this is a kind of a stretch for us. We are taking, uh, this is adult ed, you know, and so we, we're going to challenge ourselves. The first year I taught this, I was way too philosophical. And, and I see Connie sitting there. She was part of the first class, and some of them at the break were like, is this what it's going to be like with the whole thing? And then thankfully, Sister Louise had the second class and put everyone to rest. And so... But let's talk about what we mean a little more, because again, it's, it's common to hear people talking about wanting to, uh, you know, develop a spirituality, and, and it's really very common these days for people to split spirituality from religion in particular. I want to be spiritual, but I'm not necessarily religious. We'll take a look at some emphases from traditional Christian theology, and they use the language of the soul that we, are, we have a spiritual soul. We have spiritual consciousness because we have a spiritual soul. And the soul is what constitutes us as a human being. It's a philosophical language for sure. You never see a soul under a microscope. Scientists can't find evidence for a soul. We've moved out of the realm of empirical data to philosophical reflection here. But a soul is what gives something its unique form or manner of being. It gives us our humanness, if you want to use that kind of word, as opposed to, let's say, dogness or treeness. Dogs have dog souls and trees have tree souls, we'd say. And it is this soul that informs our bodily development all the way through life. So the body, we'd say, is ensouled, okay, or inspirited. You might say it the other way around, that the soul is embodied. So although body and soul are two things, they're not separate things. They belong together. The soul exists for the body and the body for the soul. According to Aristotle and later T Thomas Aquinas, the intelligence of the soul is activated by sensations from the body, which the mind works on to extract deeper meaning. So for example, I look at you and see a smile. What is a smile? It's a physical pattern created by muscles around the mouth. Uh-huh. What else is it? It's giving expression to something, isn't it? And we do that with our bodies all the time. So the body is always expressing something of soul. We are embodied souls. The spiritual soul encompasses that part of our being we call psyche as well. And some systems of understanding uh, identify the psyche as the kind of consciousness we share with higher animals. That higher animals show evidence, of course, of sensation, emotion, memory, and temperament. Now, how many of you raise dogs or have dogs or have had dogs? Does your dog have emotions? Yeah. Everyone I ever did has emotions. Do they have memory? Sure. And temperament. You ever have a litter of puppies? And I mean, you have introverts there and extroverts, don't you? I don't know about thinking types, but uh, anyway. You have some that are very outgoing and some that just kind of like to do nothing, you know? Not much, at least. Sit around. Okay? So temperament can be found at that level. However, that type of consciousness that we share with them has been elevated by the spirit. It exists for spirit. It is transparent to spirit. It even informs the spirit. So emotions now tell us something about meaning. Memory tells us something about how God has been present to us in and through the events of our lives. How we have been present to them as well. Psyche is inspirited as well as the body. So we have body, psyche, and spirit, but these aren't like stages on a rocket, like three separate things. They're like three different aspects of our one human nature. There's a holistic integration between these three levels. So though, even though we can consult one level to the exclusion of the others, we can never completely separate them. And so Christian spirituality is never about separating 
the psyche and the body from the spirit. Like we're going to be spiritual, okay? Well, we're going to pay attention to what's happening in the psyche too and in our bodies as well. You have to. Now this chart that gives us something of an interdisciplinary perspective and it's based on the work of Bernard Lonergan and Daniel Hilminiak. How many of you from year two coming back remember that? Aha! Uh -huh. See, we closed last year with a class on these two guys, so we're just kind of continuing the discussion. And those of you who are starting, well, we begin with that, so it's like bookends, all right? This approach that we give here. And, they, and their approach is that a human being is a holistic, integrated composite consisting of organism, and they use that word organism instead of uh, body, psyche, and spirit. The three interrelating, as we've noted already. But let's look at these three areas in terms of how we experience them in our everyday lives, the different kinds of needs they present to us, and the disciplines that study these different areas. Okay, first, organism or body. We have a mammalian body. Sorry to be so crude, but we are hardly different anatomically and physiologically from other higher primates in this regard. Our DNA is like 98% similar to that of a chimpanzee. So DNA can't fully explain what human consciousness is. So we have this body, and I think we all know what that's about. We are very familiar with it. The experience of the body is sensations and the various kinds of desires that are associated with the body. The different kinds of needs, you could list those, eating, resting, eliminating waste, exercising, sleeping, clothing, shelter, and so forth. You could keep adding to that list. Sciences like biology, physiology, and biochemistry study this level of our existence and demonstrate conclusively our similarity to other mammals. Traditional medicine as well focuses heavily on the operations of the body and attempts to cure illnesses using information obtained from this research. So they sometimes ignore the influence of psyche and spirit on the operation of the body, because psyche and spirit do influence how the body operates, and treat the body as something of a machine in the way that they intervene on illness and whatnot. Any questions on what it means to have a body? <laughs> I think we got that one down pat, don't we? All right. The psyche, the approach that Lonergan and Helminiak take is rather in. As we've already mentioned, it's a level of our being that we share with the higher mammals, especially the primates. But we say that the psyche is inspirited by the soul, so it's not merely an animal consciousness. It's a, it's a consciousness that is informed by and transformed by human spirit. So it tells us something about our spirituality and expresses spirit as well. And some schools of psychology do incorporate this. They are psycho-spiritual, we would say, in their approach. Can anybody give me some examples of psychologists or approaches to psychology that are more psycho-spiritual than just like dealing with emotion and memory and stuff like that. Jung would be one, yes. Psychosynthesis, yes. Heard of Viktor Frankl and his logotherapy. Frankl was a psychiatrist who really focused on the importance of meaning in human experience and that when life lacks meaning, there are many problems. So psychological experience, we'd say here, is temperament, imagery, memory, emotion, things that other animals also have, and that we have as well. The needs, being at peace, imagery, a capacity for imagery and dreaming, ability to remember, security, belonging, and you could keep adding to the list. What happens when these needs are not met? especially for long periods of time, or that one experiences a woundedness there. 
would say that one has psychological problems, right? And who do you need to see when you have psychological problems? A counselor or someone who can help you with that. And there are, of course, many different approaches for doing psychological counseling. The disciplines of psychology and one called ethology that I studied when I was in biology, which I was in for some years. Ethology is the study of animal behavior in terms of its function. So how do animals you know, pursue their need to feed themselves or their need to you know, have a sense of security or be, be secure? And it's sort of a comparative approach. But it's dealing, in the case of human beings, with psyche, with that part of our nature. Now spirit. And what I like about Lonergan and Helminiak and that whole approach, which, which is not just unique to them, it's there in a lot of different places in Christianity. It makes a distinction between psyche and spirit and names what is unique to spirit. What is the essence of our spiritual consciousness? What is it that we have that animals do not have? Perhaps they have it in a very you know, rudimentary level. So I don't want to get into a discussion like I did a few years ago about whether it's, it's a difference in kind or degree the difference in degree is so considerable that you might as well call it a difference in kind, the difference between a dog's consciousness and a human consciousness. Humans are a different kind of creature. Mammals, yes, having the same kind of consciousness in one sense that animals have, but more. We experience our spirituality as self-awareness, first of all. We are conscious of our consciousness. It's not just that we have a consciousness that is a way of knowing, even a sophisticated way of knowing, but we are present to ourselves in our acts of consciousness. That through all states of consciousness, there is an individual subject that we call I, capital I in quotations a one who is always there through all manner of experience. And we can find the continuum of that by consulting our memory. It's not just that experiences are happening as we go through life. It's that they're happening to me. This I is the one who is looking out of these eyes. And so through the body, you encounter that spiritual consciousness most powerfully through the eyes. It's a given of our experience. It's not derived from anything else. It's not secondary or resultant, but primary. It shows up even in our dreams, which is a most psychological experience. You ever notice in dreams, all kinds of things are happening. Sometimes there's a character in the dream you identify as yourself, right? We call it the dream ego. Well, there I was, I was at this party and I didn't know anybody and blah, blah, blah. Behind even that, there is an observer of the whole dream itself, including the dream ego. Ah, what's that? Yeah, that's this I that I'm talking about. Some spiritualities spend a lot of time exploring this and clarifying that. They might, you say, take, take a pathway called the path of awareness. These three different experiences of human spirit can be highly refined into something like three super highways. There's a highway of awareness, one of intellect, and one of will. And we'll talk about that some more as we go through the class. But awareness, I think, is kind of a new pathway for Christians. It's been very highly developed and refined and explored in Eastern forms of spirituality, where they try to get in touch with the roots of our experience of I, that place where it seems to just arise moment by moment not derived from anything else, but you might say straight from the hand of God. Some of them might even call it God. When they talk about self with a capital S, hmm, what are they talking about? That might take some discernment. We also have a rational intelligence or intellect that can appropriate data from the senses and do wonderful things with it, as we've already mentioned, math, language, art, conceptual knowledge. But there's something about a, that intellect that is, that is really important because its fundamental orientation is truth. 
And you might ask the question, when does it ever have enough of the truth? What do you think? Never. So it looks as though the intellect is somehow fundamentally oriented to know what can be known. Because every time you know something, it seems there's a follow-up question. Well, OK, then, uh, what about this? The answer to one question elicits another question, which keeps you searching deeper and deeper. We are called to a pathway of truth. And everybody needs to explore that to some degree, although for some people, that's their preferred pathway. And notice that Jesus presents himself to us as what? way, the truth, and the life. He satisfies these three different orientations of the human spirit. We see this manifesting even in little children. Those of you who have raised little children remember what starts happening at the age of two and three and starts driving you crazy. Why? 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 You answer the question and they'll still say why even though there's absolutely no answer to the why. And where do you eventually end up sometimes? just because <laughs> that's the way it is. <laughs> Sometimes that's as far as you can go. Okay, This hunger of ours for truth is addressed by God, we'd say, through divine revelation. We cannot, using our intellect alone, penetrate the mystery of God. But God, we, we would say, at least in our tradition, where we believe God has revealed something of God's self, God has has let us know something we could not have otherwise known. And freedom, free will, ability to direct our awareness, intellect, psyche, and bodily energies this way or that way, within limitations. And the spiritual life is about widening those limitations, expanding that zone of freedom, so we are not as determined by our conditioning from the past. Our deepest freedom is to choose our attitude in a situation. And that takes some work, doesn't it? Things happen to us, we can't help that. But the attitude we take toward it is something we do have a certain amount of freedom over. And hopefully more and more as we go along. Freedom and responsibility go together. We can use our freedom to deliberate among options and choose the course of action we will take. Freedom also opens the possibility for relationships based on love. It also opens the possibility of sin, of choosing actions that harm ourselves or others. So this superhighway that is made possible by freedom would be the way of love, which again we're all called to travel love, relationship, and as we know, Christianity has given great emphasis to this, this pathway of love. Awareness, intelligence, and freedom are inseparable, though you can lean more into one than the others. You ever notice that? When you're working a Sudoku puzzle, what part of your spiritual consciousness are you using? intellect, right? You're trying to figure this thing out. So you're really like moving your your energy in that direction. Maybe so much so that you don't even hear the alarm go off and the stuff in the oven burns. Because you're just so attentive to this puzzle. Okay? And we can give great attention to our awareness as well, to just being present to what is without being reflective. So the needs of the human spirit that come out of this, we'd say, are for love, we have a, a need for love, and other animals too have something like love that's a belonging need, but here we're talking about a love that becomes more of a friendship, blossoms into friendship, blossoms into a higher spiritual love as well. Relationship. A sense of meaning and purpose in life. Our dogs and cats don't have that need, do they? A need for purpose and meaning. They don't suffer about that as we do. To know and to understand ourselves, others, and the cosmos. To be who we were created to be. And that's the need that Lonergan calls authenticity. To be who you are, who you were created to be. And you can only do that by pursuing these pathways of awareness, 
the way of truth and the way of love that puts us in touch with that inner life I mentioned earlier. When these needs are stifled, there is spiritual illness. So we can speak of spiritual illness. What are some words that come to mind when you hear that word spiritual illness? Would be some symptoms of spiritual illness. If you just want to holler it out, that's fine. I'll repeat it. Selfishness, oh yeah, definitely. Depression can be, yeah. That the spiritual illness may be manifesting on a psychological level, but there can be other kinds of depression as well. One of them can be meaninglessness, yeah. Apathy? Desolation. Desolation, oh good, yes. Anger? All right. The kind of anger, resentment, you know. You could go on, you name hopelessness as one. That's pretty unique to spirit, isn't it? Hopelessness. Confusion. Inauthenticity. What would that be? To be a phony. Trying to be someone else. Addictions of all kinds. What about addictions? Well, sure, there's a physical dimension, especially to the chemical addictions or substance addictions. There's a psychological dimension, but there's a profound spiritual dimension to addiction as well. Notice that the 12-step programs have a spiritual concern. You're, you're going to need to do something about this higher power. Get in line with that, and whatever that means for you. It's working with the spiritual dimension of addiction as well. The disciplines of theology, philosophy, spirituality, and the arts are concerned with the life of the spirit. The arts more with giving creative expression to it, but sometimes the arts can be a way of accessing one's inner life, one's spiritual life. Theology and philosophy are more intellectual way of working with, with the spiritual life. And spirituality usually concerned more with process, with the means by which we develop that life of the spirit. Okay? So I asked earlier, now what is your spirituality? The, the place of spirituality in these disciplines is that it seems that spirituality sort of stands between psychology and philosophy. So Lonergan would talk about spirituality as, first and foremost, a philosophical psychology. It stands between. In other words, tell me something about your spirituality, and I'll tell you something about your philosophy of life. You can't separate the two. Your spirituality is giving expression to your philosophy of life. And maybe your philosophy of life is informed by theology as well. But philosophy and theology are not the same thing. Can one be on the spiritual pathway without being in a very developed theological tradition? Well, they can't help it, first of all, because they have a spiritual consciousness. We, we've made that point. But yes, they can. They're living out their philosophy of life. A couple of little pictures here. Mind is our common experience of being spiritually and psychologically alive in the body. So it's a different word, but it's sort of like our everyday experience of, of being alive in that level, of being an I, a human subject, who is working out of the uh, intellectual frame of reference using freedom and in a state of awareness. So mind encompasses realms of psyche, spirit, and bodily sensation. There is, of course, a conscious and unconscious dimension of the mind as well. Holy Spirit, we would say, the inner presence of God providing power and guidance to our human spirit. So yes, we make a distinction here between human spirit and Holy Spirit, and we'll say more about that as we go along. And of course, I'm not meaning here to separate, dissect the Holy Spirit out from the other persons of the Trinity, They're, they kind of all go together as a all for one and one for all way, you know, but it's common to speak of the Spirit as the inner presence of God. Okay. Then a couple of other areas. Let's look quickly at religion and spirituality and the relationships between those. We've already said something about spirituality being informed by philosophy. Religion 
we'll say here, is a tradition of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe, especially when considered as the creation of a supernatural agency. That's from Wikipedia. I thought it was pretty good. And you might have a different definition, but it seems that religion usually has this concern for ultimate causes, you know, possibly a creator in, in most systems, most every religious system it does have some sense of a creator. Generally begins with a founder who provides example and teaching of great relevance toward meeting one's spiritual needs. Religion then is fundamentally oriented toward spirituality, at least in its founding stages. It usually entails devotional practices, moral guidance, community membership, and worship. It gives us ways to do this together. Spirituality can often be a very private kind of experience. Religion also has a tendency to generate writings about devotional practices, morality, community life, and worship and sometimes can focus more on those traditions of writing, some would call it an exoteric dimension, its outer dimension. So it's a response to and expression of human longing in its orientation. That's again at its best. Religion helps us to orient ourselves toward the divine and is meant, again ideally, to inform and support spiritual development can and does lose this focus at times. Many today want to pursue spirituality apart from religion. What seems to happen many times is they end up having to invent some kind of religious ideology to sustain their spiritual practice. Because again, implicit in any spiritual process is some philosophical notion that's probably drawing from a theological notion. Finally, then Christian spirituality. The topic of this course. We set the stage. I'd like to spend time defining terms, especially terms that mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Christian spirituality is spiritual development in the context of Christian belief and practice. It presumes that one is a Christian, a follower of Christ, a member of the Christian religion. It's influenced by Christian traditions of wisdom, worship, morality, and spiritual discipline does not mean that one is close to other religions and the goods that they can provide, to psychological works, to scientific studies, and so forth. One looks to one's religious tradition for guidance to live out this Christian belief and practice. Christian spirituality is attentive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit in one's own conscience and consciousness those of you who are in the spiritual director formation part, that is our chief concern in spiritual direction, to be attentive to the Holy Spirit and the working of the Holy Spirit in our directee's conscience and consciousness.